The following was presented at the 2012 meeting of the Michigan Charter Boat Association. Upper Peninsula Sea Grant educator Ron Kinnanen gave an overview of fish handling procedures for captains enrolled in the Catch and Cook program. As a charter captain, here's what you equal. You actually do equal a food handler, you're a food processor. You do it, you clean the fish for the customer. You're also the safe food monitors. You want to make sure that the product is taken care of properly, you do that. Uh, but basically, we get into HACCP. Like I said, I do teach HACCP, and that stands for Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point. And those are extensive three-day courses that all our commercial fish processors are required to take. And they are regulated by our Food and Drug Administration and also the Michigan Department of Agriculture. And, and all our processes are intensively monitored. They get surprise visits from FDA investigators. They'll show up their facilities unannounced. They show them their badges. And they'll spend as much as two days at their processing facilities going over all their records and what they're doing. So it is pretty intensive what our fish processors have to go through. But anyway, if, if, and I'm not going to get into HASS up here, but Basically, what we do at HACCP is de develop what's called a hazard analysis, which determines that the fi final product will be cook cooked by the restaurant. Thus, a hazard analysis critical point, point, point plan is not required because it's going to be fine. It's going there's going to be a final cook by the customer through the restaurant. So basically, we, when that happens, most of the dangerous pathogens are actually destroyed, and that's why you don't have to have a basically a HACCP plan in place, and that's why this stuff will fly easily. Uh, most of the HACCP plans are basically developed for ready-to-eat products like smoked fish, smoked fish sausage, white fish, cream cheese dip, stuff like that. Uh, basically what we're looking at is your sanitation controls are the key to ensuring uh, the safety and quality of the final product for the catch and cook program. And I'm going to cover some of those steps in my presentation. And uh, Charter County should also be aware of standard sanitation operating procedures. They're the same procedures that are used by commercial fish processors, even if they determine they don't have to have a hassle plan if they're going to sell whitefish flakes. They don't need a hassle plan for that because it's going to be a final cooked product by somebody else. They still have to run these uh, sanitation uh, operating procedures, just like you would when you're processing your fish or handling your fish. And some of the key steps in sanitation program are the coolers on the boat have been cleaned and sanitized before the fishing day. That's a prerequisite. Ice used in the coolers to store the caught fish was made from safe water supply. You want to make sure it's uh, from potable water, acceptable water that's approved either through a municipality or if you're using well water that's approved through your local health department. And you also want to use the proper amounts of ice based on time on the water and outside temperatures. And we do have these charts available if, if you've never seen them before. Our food science department has developed amounts of ice, how much fish you're going to have in the cooler, different temperatures. So we do have those available. If you, if you need that down the road, we can get that for you. Also, the key steps in the sanitation program, all water used for cleaning and rinsing also comes from a safe water supply. And the fish cleaning equipment and contact surface are cleaned and sanitized before and after the processing of the fish. Uh, that's very important. And basically, there's eight key sanitation conditions and practices uh, that are involved that you should be aware of. And these are the ones that are here. Again, like I said earlier, you have the safety of the water. Uh, that's very important. Uh, you have the condition and cleanliness of the food contact surfaces. Anything that you're contacting the, the fish with, could be your knives, your flay knives, uh, your gloves if you're wearing gloves. Uh, tables that you're cleaning the fish on. You also want to prevent any cross-contamination of the product. Uh, maintenance of hand washing facilities, make sure those are available. Uh, protection from adulterants, if you're using any chemicals like chlorine or something, Clorox that you have on site, make sure they're uh, properly labeled, stored away, you're not having these things exposed out on the table you're cleaning fish. And you also label and store these uh, compounds away from uh, where you're processing. And also employee health conditions are very important. You don't want anybody that on the line that you know if they have a cold, if they have a flu, they have open sores. Uh, that can transfer, uh, uh, transport uh, pathogens to, uh, into the fish that can be actually uh, given to the final customer. And then exclusion of pests. Uh, again, a lot of that has to do with cleanliness around your uh, fish cleaning station. Again, safety of the water, uh, 
I assume most of these are municipal water supplies, so it's already taken care of. If not, if you're using well water, you want to make sure that it's checked at least once a year by your health department, make sure it is safe, sanitary. Uh, the key sanitation conditions, again, uh, safe supply of water that contacts food and contact surfaces. Uh, again, safe water that's used in the production of your ice. If you got ice making <coughs> equipment, you want to make sure that it is hooked up to potable water supplies that are acceptable. And then also no cross connections between potable and non-potable water. And water is basically the most important ingredient of any uh, fish processing establishment. It's used as an ingredient uh, to rinse the catch, to make the ice, to clean and sanitize fish cleaning uh, station, knives, cutting boards, containers, and equipment, and also for drinking. The ice also, uh, uh, in its solid form, it becomes the ingredient when it's used for seafood rapid chilling and during storage and transport. And ice is very important. We actually, years ago, we put together a publication which is used by the commercial fishing industry. A lot of years ago, they thought, well, we don't need ice. It's down in the low 30s or 40s. And uh, we did studies at our food science lab that shows that even using ice at these cold temperatures rapidly delays uh, the, the reproduction of bacteria. So even when it's very cold, even in the low 30s, it's important to have ice on your fish. It keeps them in a better state. And we have the research to prove it. Also, condition and cleanliness of uh, food contact surfaces. Uh, basically, uh, cleanliness and sanitation of food <coughs> contact surfaces. Uh, again, very important. Uh, basically, the type and concentration of sanitizers used. I'll cover some of these sanitizers shortly. There's a variety of them on the market. The best one to use, the cheapest and the best probably is bleach. Uh, gloves and outer garments, which might contact food, are clean and in good condition. And that's very important. If you have the wrong impression of your customers, you're wearing an apron that's torn, full of blood, your gloves are full of blood or torn, stuff like that. It doesn't give a good impression for your customers. So make sure they're checked all the time. In the commercial fishery area, they have checklists they have to go every day they're processing fish where they have to look at their equipment to make sure that it's clean, it's been properly sanitized, there's no tears in the equipment. These are regular checklists they have to have on file every day when the FDA comes and makes an inspection of the Michigan Department of Agriculture. They have to have all those records on file. But you're probably not going to get into a record keeping system, but again, it's an image that you uh, actually relay on to your customers. So make sure that uh, you, know, you do have uh, uh, clean garments, clean equipment. Okay, how to monitor? Uh, the main one is visual inspection. Again, the surfaces are in good condition. They're cleaned and sanitized. Uh, the gloves and outer garments are clean and in good repair. Uh, you're probably not going to get into this, but there is, if you get into the sanitation testing and stuff, sanitizers, uh, the concentrations are very important. And there are test strips that are on the marketplace where you can actually put them in your sanitizer solution to make sure it's the proper, proper concentration. But uh, basically, I'll just show you a regular a mixture you can use that will give you the proper concentration. Uh, food contact surface materials, which normally should be avoided if feasible. Uh, in the past, a lot of people used to use wood. Wood is not uh, really permissible anymore. A lot of micro, uh, microbiological concerns with that. Uh, you get anybody that has a wooden cutting board, you can see all the nicks and cracks that get in there. Those are a good harbor for uh, bacterial growth. So they're really not acceptable. Uh, ferrous metals, you get corrosion concerns, especially when you start using some of these uh, sanitizers. Uh, brass, the same way. Uh, galvanized metal, again, you get corrosion and chemical leaching, so really, uh, these aren't really acceptable either. And again, there are actually certain, certain state regulations, even federal regulations that frown upon these. Uh, storage of uh, clothing and gloves, and I, as I indicated er earlier, that uh, store of clothing and gloves in clean and dry locations. Sure that they're not exposed to splash, dust, or other uh, contaminants, and basically store your clean garments separately from your soiled garments and gloves. There's basically five steps of cleaning and sanitizing. Everybody probably thought, well, this is easy, just clean it up, you know, just use some soap and water and it's done. But uh, basically, what you should do is basically have a dry clean where you actually take all your chunks of material that might be on the cleaning equipment. That 
leaning table, stuff like that. Make sure you uh, squeegee that stuff away, get it out of the way. You do a pre-rinse, make sure everything's uh, rinsed off thoroughly. You know, apply a detergent. Basically, these detergents are the things that actually grab the dirt particles. They surround them and stuff. They can pull them off these surfaces. Uh, you do a post-rinse, and then you do a sanitizer. And these sanitizers don't work until you get all this other stuff done. These sanitizers have to have time to be exposed to these contact surfaces. They're not going to go through dirt and grime. They have to actually have direct exposure to these contact surfaces where they can actually kill any bacteria and viruses that are left there. There's different types of detergents on the market. Uh, there's general purpose, alkaline, chlorinated acid, enzymes. Uh, but there's plenty. I mean, just basically dishwashing detergents, fine. Don's a good one. Uh, the detergent's effectiveness varies with uh, the contact time, the temperature. Again, physical disruption when you're using these detergents. You want to also have some scrubbing that goes along with some el basically elbow grease. Uh, also, the water chemistry can affect some of these detergents, especially if you have real hard water. It might diminish some of your detergent's action. Uh, basically, when you physically remove some of the swells, uh, you can have brushes with the proper stiffness that can you know, get off some of the Grime that builds up. There's pads with these cutting properties. You can buy these anywhere in the store. Uh, also, pressure sprays. If you want to have a moderate spray. And some of these sprays, there we do a lot of stuff with the commercial <coughs> fishing industry. We, we use a term you don't want to use the fireman mentality where you start blasting water all over. Then it's coming back up on your cleaning equipment. You're recontaminating everything. So you got to be very careful on how you use these pressure sprays. You don't want to just blast water all over the Everything is contaminated. Basically, the pads, brushes, brooms should be dedicated to the task for which they're designed. Uh, and basically, it optimizes the cleaning effectiveness and it minimizes, again, cross-contamination between areas of the plant. And a lot of these things can actually be color-coded, too, greens or blues, stuff like that, so you can keep track of them. And here are some of the sanitizer concentrations commonly used in uh, food production plants. Uh, again, chlorine is a... Uh, a major one that's used. Uh, that's for food contact surfaces. Non-contact surfaces, you can use a higher concentration, concentration up to 400 parts per million. Usually in your water that coming through your municipality runs anywhere from that, three to 10 parts per million. And then you have these other sanitizers, iodine, quats, like ammonia compounds, chlorine dioxide. Uh, so those are some of the concentrations there. Again, like I said earlier, chlorine is probably by far the easiest to use. It's the cheapest. And when you buy a chlorine product, make sure you're not buying those scented ones, like lemon scented, stuff like that. They're really not acceptable by your food regulators either. If they see you using that stuff, that's, that's frowned upon. They really like you using, like our fish processors, like to see them use compounds like uh, Clorox. If you go to the Clorox website, they have some, they have a big website. I mean, they, should, they cover a lot of stuff on sanitation, different things for different uh, uh, food uh, safety programs. So I, I would say, I, you know, Clorox is a really uh, recommended brand, especially by the regulators. If you're using household bleach, this is basically a standard concentration you can use to get into that range. Like I said, that's effective for killing pathogens like the different viruses and bacteria. Basically, one pint of bleach to 12 gallons of water. And we use this on some of the stuff with our commercial fishing industry and our sanitation publications that we use with that industry. Again, like I said earlier, there's a bunch of different types of sanitizers, uh, chlorine, the iodophores, and the iodophores are basically just the iodine. Those are the same compounds they use like when they disinfect the AIDS, the VHS virus. Uh, these quad products are basically ammonia compounds. One thing about these ammonia compounds, if, if you're going to have your fish cleaning tables exposed maybe for a long time, like overnight or a couple days, uh, these quad and ammonia programs are longer lasting. They'll that residue will stay on that for a couple days. So you want to make sure it's rinsed off. So if you want a long-lasting compound after a while, these chlorine products tend to evaporate over time. They leave evaporate in the air. And again, some of the properties here, uh, uh, chlorine, uh, basically you can see here on this chart here, uh, basically it kills most of the microorganisms. Uh, it's elect less affected by hard water than some. It does not uh, basically form these films. 
and it's very effective at low temperatures. Again, when you use chlorines too, you don't want to use it in hot water. You want to make sure you're using cold water. That's where it works best. Using hot water, basically, the chlorine just dissipates off in the gas form. Again, that's why I say it's good to use because it's relatively inexpensive. But again, if you want to use these other ones, but again, I recommend chlorine. You stick with chlorine. That's probably the best one. And again, like I said earlier, improper cleaning, dirty floors, recontamination after cleaning, splash. Uh, if you're using high pressure water, uh, make sure you're not splashing water all over because you can just recontaminate a lot of your uh, clean surfaces. And then also proper labeling of containers. If you're using a chlorine product, make sure those labels are, are on the product. Don't rip them off. Don't have, just have a white junk container, which after a while you don't even know what's in it. Make sure that those labels stay on the product uh, because it has a lot of instructions that are how it should be used. But again, it has a manufacturer's name, pack distributed by. And again, that's where your instructions are for proper use, especially if you're dealing with these uh, sanitation products. Again, it must show the name of the compound or solution in the container and the instructions for proper use. Also, storing these compounds. Uh, you may want to have a cabinet to the side uh, where you store them. Uh, you don't want to be having them sit right on in your uh, cleaning table where you're processing fish. That's a no-no. Keep those things away from your processing table. Only use them after all the products are processed. Then you can bring these things out. Uh, for cleaning and sanitizing. Some of the common daily sanitation practices to prevent cross-contamination. Again, adequate separation of processed and unprocessed fish. So if you have processed fish that's already ready to go to the restaurant, it's packaged, make sure it's separated at a good distance from the fish that you're processing so there's no recontamination. Re Uh, food handling or processing areas and equipment adequately cleaned and sanitized. Again, that should be done. Uh, uh, make sure that everything's clean before you start, especially after the end of your processing where everything's cleaned up and sanitized. Uh, employee hygiene is very important. Uh, dress and hand washing practices. Uh, again, employee food handling practices. And also employee traffic movement about the fish cleaning station. Some of the examples of poor employee practices are is working near or on the floor when handling product. That's a no-no. You never want to you know, work on the floor. Uh, when you get into these fish processing plants, everything's got to be on pallets, even if on, on the cement floors and stuff like that. Nothing can go on the floors. Uh, returning from the restrooms without washing hands, that's a no-no. Hands got to be washed all the time. Uh, shovels that are used to handle floor uh, waste, also use the handle products, that's a no man. So make sure that equipment is uh, differentiated between what you're cleaning up on the floor and what you're gonna use in your food contact <laughs> services. Uh, just like any restaurants or any food handlers, scratching of the face and then handling the product is a no-no. And then touching unclean, say, cooler handles or other equipment and then handling product is also, you're getting recontamination with all this stuff. Employee hy hygiene and food handling practices. Uh, the goal is to prevent cross-contamination of fish by ensuring that the employees follow a proper, proper personal hygiene and hand washing practices. Get into hand washing, jewelry. Uh, try to remove as much uh, jewelry as possible when you're, uh, you know, even when you're handling, cleaning the fish too, also before you hand wash, but when you're actually cleaning the fish. Also, uh, here's hair nets, hair beards, uh, make sure proper footwear is used. Uh, eating and drinking and smoking should be prohibited from, uh, from these areas. And uh, also, use of medications, cosmetics in those areas should be prohibited. Reasons for a hand washing uh, a program is many employees do not routinely wash their hands. Again, that's very important. Many employees do not understand the importance of washing hands. And we do a lot of videos during a lot of our training programs with the commercial fishing industry just to show an average wash hand. Just take a few seconds and stuff. And 
you can actually put these dies on your hands. You can see how much you miss. You can see all these areas on the hand. And really, when you do a hand washing, arm scrubbing, uh, this should be at least for 30 seconds or more. And do a thorough scrubbing. Again, remove the jewelry when you wash your hands. Uh, wet hands and arms with warm water about uh, 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Lather and rub using warm water, rinse, and dry with uh, disposable paper towels. And avoid recontamination. And if you're in an area where you're, you're actually in a bathroom or something like that, the, the garbage should be near the door, so you don't even have to handle the door. You push your way out or use a these paper towels and open the door and then throw it in the garbage. And if you're in a place like that that doesn't have it, you just put those little paper wads right by the door. Pretty soon they put their garbages by the door. When to wash arms and hands after touching bare human body parts other than the clean hands and clean exposed portions of the arms. So they'll be scratching your belly button in front of your customers and then you know just they're cleaning the fish. After using the toilet room, after coughing, sneezing, using handkerchief or disposable tissue, using tobacco, eating, drinking, a lot of these are common sense, but you know, once you learn this stuff, you can look at restaurants and see somebody scratching their nose or wiping their head and then making your sandwich, so you start to notice this stuff. <laughs> and it does happen. After handling soiled equipment or utensils. And then during food preparation, as often as necessary, remove all soil and contamination to prevent cross-contamination and changing tasks. It's important to have, again, uh, uh, clean uh, conditions in the hand washing facilities. Uh, probably not going to get into hand sanitizer, but you could have these uh, dips available and you can make them up to about 200 parts per minute if you want. And then, uh, again, you've got to have condition of the toilet facilities. And in most commercial places, they actually have a, a checklist on those to make sure when they were clean last, when the paper towels refilled, soap dispensers refilled. And you'll see these are a lot of commercial places where uh, they do keep data on that. And basically, it's to support necessary hand washing program to prevent the spread of filth and potential pathogenic organisms, both the processing area and most importantly is on the food product that your customers are And these are some of the recommended monitoring for hand washing, hand sanitizing in toilet facilities. Again, condition of the hand washing facilities. Uh, make sure there's, uh, again, proper uh, you know, soap available, hot enough water, paper towels available. Again, condition of the toilet facilities that are available on site. Some of the corrections, basically fix or replenish supplies in toilet and hand wash stations. And again, a lot of these places you can have a checklist to be kept uh, throughout the day. Discard and make up new hand sanitizer solution if concentration is incorrect. If you use these, again, they do have test strips available. And you can see when these uh, sanitizers are becoming too weak to be effective. And then re record observations of corrections taken when unsatisfactory conditions are observed and repair improperly working toilets. And then for the hand washing facilities, basically clean at all times. Strategically located as per regulations, near bathrooms and entrances to the processing area. Then you also have dedicated hand washing only, and that's what uh, you really should have on site is even at these processing facilities, and even if somebody goes to the bathroom, where you wash your hands in public in front of everybody, too. That's very important to have those available. I think that's what you have at your cleaning stations, right? You have these places where you can wash your hands. Again, it's important to have a liquid, liquid soap dispenser. The hot water is important. Again, it should be at least 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, use of disposable towels or air blowers. <coughs> And again, if you're going to use it, uh, these sanitizing facilities have a nest of your hand washing areas. If you use hand sanitizing facilities, again, you want to have the proper sanitizer concentration. Uh, with chlorine, usually about 100 to 200 parts per million. 
uh, anywhere from 12 and a half to 25 parts per million for human anxiety. The thing about iodine, it stains. Get that gold and the reddish color. So, uh, frequent monitoring and changes to maintain proper concentrations, and then uh, conveniently located and encouraging place to use, but to avoid contact. <coughs> Some of the common symptoms and conditions to be aware of in uh, the processing plant. If you have sick employees, again, they shouldn't be anywhere around when they're pro uh, where you're processing fish. Uh, look at any of these right here. And if you have your mates or your char captain yourself, if you have any of these signs or symptoms, you don't want to be processing fish because uh, that's how uh, products are contaminated. And these are some of the pathogens and the illness that can be transmitted to food by infected employees. You see there's a pretty good list there. And yes, all this can come from humans. I mean, it is. Uh, these things are all prevalent out there, and they do cause foodborne illness. And they come from humans. And again, you can see some of the rope of disease originated from uh, food handlers. Be from the respiratory tract through coughing and sneezing, be from open sores, cuts and boils, and from the intestinal tract. Again, that's with uh, improper uh, hand washing or no hand washing. Then the other thing is pests. Uh, you want to make sure that you can exclude those from your processing area because, uh, again, there's a lot of foodborne illnesses that can be transmitted by these uh, pests which are numerous. Uh, things like flies and cockroaches can transmit uh, salmonella, staphylococcus, different forms of uh, clostridium, shigella, streptococcus, and others. So again, you can see that uh, it's our great transmitters of these uh, uh, agents. Rodents, like mice, are sources of salmonella and parasites. And also birds are hosts for a variety of pathogens, such as uh, salmonella and steric. Basically, the goal is to uh, monitor and confirm that pests are excluded from relevant areas of the plant to the extent possible. It should also confirm that the procedures are followed to prevent infestation. Uh, at these commercial operations that I work with, they have to have records of all this stuff. A lot of them do even hire commercial pest operators to take care of that for them if they're not doing it. They have to have records of all that. So, and in your fish cleaning stations, again, you want to make sure that uh, you know things are kept clean. Lawns are being mowed around there so they're not harbored to any of these rodents. Uh, and that's a big thing. Even these regulators, when they come to these fish processing plants, they'll look at the grounds outside and they can write uh, uh, citations up if they're not even, if the grass isn't properly mowed down to a certain level. Because rodents don't like to travel over these open areas with short grass. How we get in the fish transfer to the customer? And there was some earlier discussion about that earlier with Dan and Danny was talking about this is uh, fish is packaged in uh, food grade packaging material. Uh, the handling instructions on the package that includes recommended storage temperature of 41 degrees Fahrenheit or less. Uh, again, make sure that the customer has a cooler with ice. <laughs> then provide uh, proper documentation of the date time on the packaging indicating when the fish are caught using the proper cook, catch and cook labels. Uh, Denny said that right now I guess you can write it on the package, but I heard a good comment back here where you can just take those labels and just go home and mass produce them on waterproof paper. So that would be a good alternative, so you have that label with you. And then fish must be delivered to the restaurant within two hours of processing because, you know, they, are, they have some liability too, so they want to make sure that uh, they're getting a good product when it comes into the restaurant. With that, I'll take any questions. What I usually do when I'm filleting fish for my guests, I, I uh, put them in Ziploc, gallon size uh, Ziploc storage bags. Is that uh, sufficient packaging or, or? Yeah, you, you have ice in, you put the ice right in there with them or just put the ice around them? I'll put the ice around them. Yeah. Put, put the yeah, food Ziploc food. is fine. It's a food grade Ziploc, so it's a commercial grade food. Yeah, right. it's, it's not a problem. They're, they're considered a reason. That's for your. Caption, that's for the program, right? No, that's what I call it. 
I want to get in this program. Yeah. Okay. yeah, you can do it that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's not a problem. If you're using any food grade material, that is not a problem. Okay. Yeah, you can store sure. it in there. Yeah. Yep. So long as it's food grade. Does your fish team, fish cleaning station have to be included and closed or can it be an open area where you're cleaning it every time before you You mean where it's where the where you look at the sky above you? Yeah. And why I say that, because some areas the fish cleaning station is so poor at marina, you don't even want to be in there. Yeah. You know, if a guy made his own outside his boat, and all the cleaning facilities, the marine green. I think some of this is gonna maybe come to local health departments whether they you know they accept it or not. But I think if you're cleaning your fish, you know, before you start, make sure everything is sanitized and cleaned up and then you know, make sure birds aren't dropping from the top either, stuff like that. But, uh, but it shouldn't be a problem. If everything is sanitized and clean and, you know, and it's taken care of, it shouldn't be a problem. Because I realize not everybody has the right facility you know, in their area. Any other questions? Thanks, Rob. This has been a presentation of Michigan Sea Grant. Join us at our website or YouTube channel for additional information on Great Lakes fisheries and ecology.